The Game of Life and How to Play It by Florence Scovel Shin Most people consider life a battle, but it is not a battle, it is a game. It is a game, however, which cannot be played successfully without the knowledge of spiritual law. Whatsoever a woman soweth, that shall she also reap. This means that whatever woman sends out in word or deed will return to her, and what she gives, she will receive. If she gives hate, she will receive hate. If she gives love, she will receive love. If she gives criticism, she will receive criticism. If she lies, she will be lied to. If she cheats, she will be cheated. We are taught also that the imaging facility plays a large part in the game of life. Keep thy heart, or imagination, with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. This means that whatever woman images sooner or later externalizes in her affairs. I know of a woman who feared a certain disease. It was a very rare disease and very difficult to get. But she pictured it continually and read about it until it manifested in her body and she died the victim of distorted imagination. So we see to play life successfully, we must train the imaging faculty. A person with an imaging faculty trained to image only good brings into her life every righteous desire of her heart. Health, wealth, love, friends, perfect self-expression, her highest ideals. The imagination has been called the scissors of the mind, and it is ever cutting, cutting, day by day, the pictures woman sees there, and sooner or later she meets her own creations in her outer world. To train the imagination successfully, woman must understand the workings of her mind. The Greeks said, Know thyself. There are three departments of the mind, the subconscious, conscious and superconscious. The subconscious is simply power without direction. It is like steam or electricity. And it does what it is directed to do. It has no power of induction. Whatever a woman feels deeply or images clearly is impressed upon the subconscious mind and carried out in minutest detail. For example, a woman I know, when a child, always made believe she was a widow. She dressed up in black clothes and wore a long black veil, and people thought she was very clever and amusing. She grew up and married a man with whom she was deeply in love. In a short time he died and she wore black and a sweeping veil for many years. The picture of herself as a widow was impressed upon the subconscious mind, and in due time worked itself out regardless of the havoc created. The conscious mind has been called mortal or carnal mind. It is the human mind and sees life as it appears to be. It sees death, disaster, sickness, poverty and limitation of every kind. And it impresses the subconscious. The superconscious mind is the God mind within each woman and is the realm of perfect ideas. In it is the perfect pattern spoken of by Plato, the divine design for there is a divine design for each person. There is a place that you are to fill and no one else can fill, something you are to do which no one else can do. There is a perfect picture of this in the superconscious mind. It usually flashes across the conscious as an unattainable ideal, something too good to be true. In reality, it is woman's true destiny or destination, flashed to her from the infinite intelligence which is within herself. Many people, however, are in ignorance of their true destinies and are striving for things and situations which do not belong to them and would only bring failure and dissatisfaction if attained. For example, a woman came to me and asked me to speak the word that she would marry a certain man with whom she was very much in love. She called him A.B. I replied that this would be a violation of spiritual law but that I would speak the word for the right man, the divine selection, the man who belonged to her by divine right. I added, if A.B. is the right man, you can't lose him, and if he isn't, you will receive his equivalent. She saw A.B. frequently, but no headway was made in their friendship. 
One evening she called and said, Do you know, for the last week, A.B. hasn't seemed so wonderful to me. I replied, Maybe he's not the divine selection. Another man may be the right one. Soon after that she met another man, who fell in love with her at once, and who said she was his ideal. In fact, he said all the things that she had always wished A.B. would say to her. She remarked it was quite uncanny. She soon returned his love and lost all interest in A.B. This shows the law of substitution. A right idea was substituted for a wrong one, and therefore there was no loss or sacrifice involved. Many people have brought disaster into their lives through idle words. For example, a woman once asked me why her life was now one of poverty and limitation. Formerly she had had a home, was surrounded by beautiful things, and had often tired of the management of her home, and had said repeatedly, I'm sick and tired of things, I wish I lived in a trunk. And she added, Today I'm living in that trunk. She had spoken herself into a trunk. The subconscious mind has no sense of humour, and people often joke themselves into unhappy experiences. For example, a woman had a great deal of money, and she joked continually about getting ready for the poorhouse. In a few years she was almost destitute, having impressed the subconscious mind with a picture of lack and limitation. Fortunately, the law works both ways, and a situation of lack may be changed to one of plenty. For example, a woman came to me one hot summer's day for a treatment for prosperity. She was worn out, dejected and discouraged. She said she possessed just eight dollars in the world. I said, good, we'll bless the eight dollars and multiply them as Jesus Christ multiplied the loaves and the fishes. For he taught that every woman had the power to bless and to multiply, to heal and to prosper. She said, what shall I do next? I replied, follow intuition. Have you a hunch to do anything or to go anywhere? Intuition means intuition or to be taught from within. It is woman's unerring guide, and I will deal more fully with its laws in a following chapter. The woman replied, I don't know. I seem to have a hunch to go home. I have just enough money for car fare. Her home was in a distant city, and was one of lack and limitation. And the reasoning mind or intellect would have said, Stay in New York and get work and make some money. I replied, Then go home. Never violate a hunch. I spoke the following words for her. Infinite spirit, open the way for great abundance for this woman. She is an irresistible magnet for all that belongs to her by divine right. I told her to repeat it continually also. She left for home immediately. In calling on a woman one day, she linked up with an old friend of her family. Through this friend, she received thousands of dollars in a most miraculous way. She has said to me often, Tell people about the woman who came to you with eight dollars and a hunch. There is always plenty on woman's pathway, but it can only be brought into manifestation through desire, faith or the spoken word. Woman must make the first move. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. In the scriptures we read, Concerning the works of my hands, command ye me. Infinite intelligence, God is ever ready to carry out woman's smallest or greatest demands. Every desire, uttered or unexpressed, is a demand. We are often startled by having a wish suddenly fulfilled. For example, one Easter, having seen many beautiful rose trees in the florist's windows, I wished I could receive one and for an instant saw it mentally being carried to the door. Easter came, and with it a beautiful rose tree. I thanked my friend the following day, and told her it was just what I had wanted. She replied, I didn't send you a rose tree, I sent you lilies. The man had mixed the order, and sent me a rose tree simply because I had started the law in action, and I had to have a rose tree. Nothing stands between woman and her largest ideals in every desire of her heart, but doubt and fear. When a woman can wish without worrying, every desire will be instantly fulfilled. I will explain more fully in a following chapter the scientific reason for this, and why fear must be erased from the consciousness.
It is woman's only enemy. Fear of lack, fear of failure, fear of sickness, fear of loss, and a feeling of insecurity on some plane. So we can see we must substitute faith for fear. For fear is only inverted faith. It is faith in evil instead of good. The object of the game of life is to see clearly one's good and to obliterate all mental pictures of evil. This must be done by impressing the subconscious mind with a realization of good. A very brilliant woman who has attained great success told me she had suddenly erased all fear from her consciousness by reading a sign which hung in a room. She saw printed in large letters this statement. Why worry? It will probably never happen. These words were stamped indelibly upon her subconscious mind, and she now has a firm conviction that only good can come into her life, therefore only good can manifest. In the following chapter, I will deal with the different methods of impressing the subconscious mind. It is woman's faithful servant, but one must be careful to give it the right orders. Woman has ever a silent listener at her side, her subconscious mind. Every thought, every word is impressed upon it and carried out in amazing detail. It is like a singer making a record on the sensitive disc of the phonographic plate. Every note and tone of the singer's voice is registered. If she coughs or hesitates, it is registered also. So let us break all the old bad records in the subconscious mind, the records of our lives which we do not wish to keep, and make new and beautiful ones. Speak these words aloud with power and conviction. I now smash and demolish by my spoken word every untrue record in my subconscious mind. They shall return to the dust heap of their native nothingness, for they come from my own vain imaginings. I now make my perfect records, the records of health, wealth, love, and perfect self-expression. This is the square of life, the game completed. In the following chapters, I will show how woman can change her conditions by changing her words. Any woman who does not know the power of the word is behind the times. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. The Law of Prosperity One of the greatest messages given is that God is woman's supply and that woman can release through her spoken word all that belongs to her by divine right. She must, however, have perfect faith in her spoken word. Isaiah said, My word shall not return unto me void, but shall accomplish that where it is sent. We know now that words and thoughts are a tremendous vibratory force, ever moulding woman's body and affairs. A woman came to me in great distress and said she was to be sued on the 15th of the month for $3,000. She knew no way of getting the money and was in despair. I told her that God was her supply, and that there is supply for every demand. So I spoke the word, I gave thanks that the woman would receive the $3,000 at the right time in the right way. I told her that she must have perfect faith, and act her perfect faith. The 15th came, but no money had materialized. She called me on the phone and asked me what she was to do. I replied, it is Saturday, so they won't sue you today. Your part is to act rich, thereby showing perfect faith that you will receive it by Monday. She asked me to lunch with her to keep up her courage. When I joined her at a restaurant, I said, This is no time to economize. Order an expensive lunch and act as if you have already received the $3,000. All things whatsoever ye ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. You must act as if you had already received. The next morning she called me on the phone and asked me to stay with her during the day. I said, no, you are divinely protected and God is never too late. In the evening she phoned again, greatly excited, and said, my dear, a miracle has happened. I was sitting in my room this morning when the doorbell rang. I said to the maid, don't let anyone in. The maid, however, looked out the window and said, it is your cousin with the long white hair. So I said, call her back, I would like to see her. She was just turning the corner when she heard the maid's voice and she came back. She talked for about an hour, and just as she was leaving, she said, Oh, by the way, how are your finances? I told her I needed the money, and she said, 
Why, my dear, I will give you three thousand dollars at the first of the month. I didn't like to tell her I was going to be sued. What shall I do? I won't receive it until the first of the month, and I must have it tomorrow. I said, I'll keep on treating. I said, Spirit is never too late. I give thanks that she has received the money on the invisible plane and that it manifests in time. The next morning, her cousin called her up and said, Come into my office this morning and I will give you the money. That afternoon, she had $3,000 to her credit in the bank and wrote checks as rapidly as her excitement would permit. If one asks for success and prepares for failure, she will get the situation she has prepared for. For example, a woman came to me asking me to speak the word for a certain debt to be wiped out. I found she spent her time planning what she would say to the woman when she did not pay her bill, thereby neutralizing my words. She should have seen herself paying the debt. Woman must prepare for the things she has asked for, when there isn't the slightest sign of it in sight. For example, a woman found it necessary to look for an apartment during the year when there was a great shortage of apartments in New York. It was considered almost an impossibility, and her friends were sorry for her and said, Isn't it too bad you'll have to store your furniture and live in a hotel? She replied, You needn't feel sorry for me. I'm a superwoman and I'll get an apartment. She spoke the words, Infinite Spirit, open the way for the right apartment. She knew there was a supply for every demand, and that she was unconditioned working on the spiritual plane, and that one with God is a majority. She had contemplated buying new blankets when the tempter, the adverse thought of, or reasoning mind, suggested, Don't buy the blankets. Perhaps after all you won't get an apartment and you will have no use for them. She promptly replied to herself, I'll dig my ditches by buying the blankets. So she prepared for the apartment and acted as though she already had it. She found one in a miraculous way and it was given to her although there were over 200 other applicants. The blankets showed active faith. Getting into the spiritual swing of things is no easy matter for the average person. The adverse thoughts of doubt and fear surge from the subconscious. They are the army of aliens which must be put to flight. This explains why it is so often darkest before the dawn. A big demonstration is usually preceded by tormenting thoughts. Having made a statement of high spiritual truth, one challenges the old beliefs in the subconscious, and error is exposed to be put out. This is the time when one must make her affirmations of truth repeatedly, and rejoice and give thanks that she has already received. Before ye call, I shall answer. This means that every good and perfect gift is already woman's awaiting her recognition. Woman can only receive what she sees herself receiving. The children of Israel were told that they could have all the land they could see. This is true of every woman. She has only the land within her own mental vision. Every great work, every big accomplishment, has been brought into manifestation through holding to the vision, and often just before the big achievement comes apparent failure and discouragement. The children of Israel, when they reached the promised land, were afraid to go in, for they said it was filled with giants who made them feel like grasshoppers. This is almost every woman's experience. However, the one who knows the spiritual law is undisturbed by appearance and rejoices while she is yet in captivity. That is, she holds to her vision and gives thanks that the end is accomplished. She has received. So woman must ever hold to the vision of her journey's end and demand the manifestation of that which she has already received. It may be her perfect health, love, supply, self-expression, home or friends. They are all finished and perfect ideas registered in divine mind, woman's own superconscious mind, and must come through her, not to her. For example, a woman came to me asking for treatments for success. It was imperative that she raise within a certain time $50,000 for her business. The time limit was almost up, and she came to me in despair. No one wanted to invest in her enterprise, and the bank had flatly refused a loan. 
I replied, I suppose you lost your temper while at the bank, therefore your power. You can control any situation if you first control yourself. Go back to the bank, I added, and I will treat. My treatment was, you are identified in love with the spirit of everyone connected to the bank. Let the divine idea come out of this situation. She replied, You are now talking about an impossibility. Tomorrow is Saturday, the bank closes at 12, and my train won't get me there until 10, and the time limit is tomorrow, and anyway they won't do it, it is too late. I replied, God doesn't need any time, and is never too late. She replied, It all sounds fine when I sit here listening to you, but when I go out it's terrible. She lived in a distant city, and I didn't hear from her for a week. Then came a letter. It read, You were right. I raised the money and will never again doubt the truth of all you have told me. I saw her a few weeks later and said, What happened? You evidently had plenty of time after all. She replied, My train was late, and I got there just 15 minutes before 12. I walked into the bank quietly and said, I have come for the loan and they gave it to me without a question. It was the last fifteen minutes of the allotted time to her, and infinite spirit was not too late. In this instance, the woman could never have demonstrated alone. She needed someone to help her hold to the vision. This is what one woman can do for another. One gets too close to her own affairs and becomes doubtful and fearful. The friend or healer sees clearly the success, health or prosperity and never wavers because she is not close to the situation. It is much easier to demonstrate for someone else than for oneself, so a person should not hesitate to ask for help if she feels herself wavering. A keen observer of life once said, No woman can fail if some one person sees her successful. Such is the power of the vision and many a great woman owed her success to a wife or husband, to a sister or friend who believed in her, and held without wavering to the perfect pattern. Understanding the Power of the Word A person knowing the power of the word becomes very careful of her conversation. She has only to watch the reaction of her words to know that they do not return void. Through her spoken word, woman is continually making laws for herself. I know a woman who said, I always miss a car. It invariably pulls out just as I arrive. Her daughter said, I always catch a car. It is sure to come just as I get there. This occurred for years. Each had made a separate law for themselves. One of failure, one of success. This is the psychology of superstitions. The horseshoe or rabbit's foot contains no power, but woman's spoken word and belief that it will bring good luck creates expectancy in the subconscious mind and attracts a lucky situation. I find, however, that this will not work when woman has advanced spiritually and knows a higher law. One cannot turn back and must put away graven images. For example, two women in my class had great success in business for several months when suddenly everything went to smash. We tried to analyze the situation and I found that instead of making their affirmations and looking to God for success and prosperity, they had each bought a lucky monkey. I said, oh, I see. You have been trusting in lucky monkeys instead of God. Put away the lucky monkeys and call on the law of forgiveness. A woman has power to forgive or neutralize her mistakes. They decided to throw the lucky monkeys down a coal hole and all went well again. This does not mean, however, that one should throw away every lucky ornament or horseshoe about the house, but she must recognize that the power back of it is the one and only power, and that the object simply gives her a feeling of expectancy. I was with a friend one day who was in deep despair. In crossing the street, she picked up a horseshoe. Immediately, she was filled with joy and hope. She said God had sent her the horseshoe in order to keep up her courage. It was indeed at that moment about the only thing that could have registered in her consciousness. Her hope became faith, and she ultimately made a wonderful demonstration. I wish to make the point clear that the women previously mentioned were depending on the monkeys alone, while this woman recognized the power in the back of the horseshoe. I know in my own case it took a long while to get out of a belief 
that a certain thing brought disappointment. If the thing happened, disappointment invariably followed. I found the only way I could make a change in the subconscious was by asserting, there are not two powers, there is only one power, God. Therefore there are not disappointments, and this thing means a happy surprise. I noticed a change at once, and happy surprises commenced coming my way. I have a friend who said nothing could induce her to walk under a ladder. I said, if you are afraid, you are giving into a belief in two powers, good and evil, instead of one. As God is absolute, there can be no opposing power, unless woman makes the false evil for herself. To show you believe in only one power, God, and that there is no power or reality in evil, walk under the next ladder you see. Soon after, she went to her bank. She wished to open her box in the safe deposit vault, and there stood a ladder in her pathway. It was impossible to reach the box without passing under the ladder. She quailed with fear and turned back. She could not face the lion in her pathway. However, when she reached the street, my words rang in her ears, and she decided to return and walk under it. It was a big moment in her life, for ladders had held her bondage for many years. She retraced her steps to the vault, and the ladder was no longer there. This so often happens. If one is willing to do the thing that she is afraid to do, she does not have to. It is the law of non-resistance, which is so little understood. Someone has said that courage contains genius and magic. Face a situation fearlessly and there is no situation to face. It falls away of its own weight. The explanation is that fear attracted the ladder on the woman's pathway and fearlessness removed it. Thus the invisible forces are ever working for woman who is always pulling the strings herself, although she does not know it. Owing to the vibratory power of words, whatever woman voices she begins to attract. People who continually speak of disease invariably attract it. After woman knows the truth, she cannot be too careful of her words. For example, I have a friend who often says on the phone, do come to see me and have an old-fashioned chat. This old-fashioned chat means an hour of about 500 to 1,000 destructive words, the principal topics being loss, lack, failure and sickness. I reply, no thank you. I've had enough of old-fashioned chats in my life. They're too expensive. But I will be glad to have a new-fashioned chat and talk about what we want, not what we don't want. There is an old saying that woman only dares use her words for three purposes, to heal, bless or prosper. What woman says of others will be said of her, and what she wishes for another, she is wishing for herself. Curses like chickens come home to roost. If a woman wishes someone bad luck, she is sure to attract bad luck herself. If she wishes to aid someone to success, she is wishing and aiding herself to success. The body may be renewed and transformed through the spoken word and clear vision, and disease be completely wiped out of the consciousness. A metaphysician knows that all disease has a mental correspondence, and in order to heal the body, one must first heal the soul. The soul is a subconscious mind and must be saved from wrong thinking. A woman I know had for years an appearance of a terrible skin disease. The doctors told her it was incurable and she was in despair. She was on the stage and she feared she would soon have to give up her profession and she had no other means of support. However, she procured a good engagement and on the opening night made a great hit. She received flattering notices from the critics and was joyful and elated. The next day, she received a notice of dismissal. A man in the cast had been jealous of her success and had caused her to be sent away. She felt hatred and resentment, taking complete possession of her, and she cried out, Oh God, don't let me hate that man. That night she worked for hours in the silence. She said, I soon came to a very deep silence. I seemed to be at peace with myself, with the man and with the whole world. I continued this for two following nights, and on the third day I found I was healed completely of the skin disease. In asking for love or goodwill, she had fulfilled the law, for love is fulfilling of the law, and the disease, which came from a subconscious resentment, was wiped out. 
Every disease is caused by a mind not at ease. I said once in my class, there's no use asking anyone what's the matter with you. We might as well say, who's the matter with you? Unforgiveness is the most prolific cause of disease. It will harden arteries or liver and affect the eyesight. In its train are endless ills. I called on a woman one day who said she was ill from having eaten an oyster. I replied, oh no, the oyster was harmless. You poisoned the oyster. What's the matter with you? She answered, oh, about 19 people. She had quarrelled with 19 people and had become so inharmonious that she attracted the wrong oyster. Any inharmony in the external indicates that there is mental inharmony. As the within, so the without. A woman came to me asking to treat for success in business. She was selling machinery, and a rival appeared on the scene with what she proclaimed was a better machine, and my friend feared defeat. I said, first of all, we must wipe out all fear, and know that God protects your interest, and that the divine idea must come out of the situation. That is, the right machine will be sold by the right woman to the right woman. And I added, don't hold one critical thought towards that woman. Bless her all day and be willing not to sell your machine if it isn't the divine idea. So she went to the meeting, fearless and non-resistant, and blessing the other woman. She said the outcome was very remarkable. The other woman's machine refused to work, and she sold hers without the slightest difficulty. The Law of Non-Resistance Nothing on earth can resist an absolutely non-resistant person. The Chinese say that water is the most powerful element because it is perfectly non-resistant. It can wear away a rock and sweep all before it. There is an old legend that Adam and Eve ate of Maya the tree of illusion and saw two powers instead of one power, God. We have seen in a preceding chapter that woman's soul is her subconscious mind and whatever she feels deeply, good or bad, is outpictured by that faithful servant. Her body and affairs show forth what she has been picturing. The sick woman has pictured sickness, the poor woman poverty, and the rich woman wealth. I heard a metaphysician once say, if you do not run your subconscious mind yourself, someone else will run it for you. The woman who is centred and established in right thinking, the woman who sends out only good will to her fellow woman, and who is without fear, cannot be touched or influenced by the negative thoughts of others. In fact, she could then only receive good thoughts, as she herself sends forth only good thoughts. Resistance is hell, for it places woman in a state of torment. A woman who required money, who knew the spiritual law of opulence, was thrown continually in a business way with a man who made her feel very poor. He talked lack and limitation, and she commenced to catch his poverty thoughts. So she disliked him and blamed him for her failure. She knew in order to demonstrate her supply, she must first feel she had received. A feeling of opulence must precede its manifestation. It dawned on her one day that she was resisting the situation and seeing two powers instead of one. So she blessed the man and baptized the situation's success. She affirmed, as there is only one power, God, this man is here for my good and my prosperity. Just what he did not seem to be there for. Soon after that, she met, through this man, a woman who gave her, for a service rendered, several thousand dollars, and the man moved to a distant city and faded harmoniously from her life. Make the statement, Every person is a golden link in the chain for my good. For all people are God in manifestation awaiting the opportunity given by woman herself to serve the divine plans of her life. Bless your enemy and you rob them of their ammunition. Their arrows will be transmuted into blessings. This law is true of nations as well as individuals. Bless a nation, send love and goodwill to every inhabitant, and it is robbed of its power to harm. Woman can only get the right idea of non-resistance through spiritual understanding. My students have often said, I don't want to be a doormat. I reply, when you use non-resistance with wisdom, 
no one will ever be able to walk over you. Another example. One day, I was impatiently awaiting an important telephone call. I resisted every call that came in and made no outgoing calls myself, reasoning that it might interfere with the one I was awaiting. Instead of saying, divine ideas never conflict, the call will come at the right time, leaving it to infinite intelligence to arrange, I commenced to manage things myself. I made the battle mine and remained tense and anxious. The bell did not ring for about an hour and I glanced at the phone and found the receiver had been off that length of time and the phone was disconnected. My anxiety, fear and belief in interference had brought on a total eclipse of the telephone. Realising what I had done, I commenced blessing the situation at once. I baptised it as success and affirmed, I cannot lose any call that belongs to me by divine right. I am under grace and not under law. A friend rushed out to the nearest telephone to notify the company to reconnect. She entered a crowded grocery, but the proprietor left his customers and attended to the call himself. My phone was connected at once, and two minutes later I received a very important call, and about an hour afterward, the one I had been awaiting. One's ships come in over a calm sea. So long as woman resists a situation, she will have it with her. If she runs away from it, it will run after her. For example, I repeated this to a woman one day and she replied, How true that is. I was unhappy at home. I disliked my mother who was critical and domineering, so I ran away and was married. But I married my mother, for my husband was exactly like my mother, and I had the same situation to face again. Agree with thine adversary quickly. This means, agree that the adverse situation is good, be undisturbed by it, and it falls away of its own weight. None of these things move me, is a wonderful affirmation. The inharmonious situation comes from some inharmony within woman herself. When there is in her no emotional response to an inharmonious situation, it falls away forever from her pathway so we see woman's work is ever within herself. People have said to me, give treatments to change my husband or my brother. I reply, no, I will give treatments to change you. When you change, your husband and your brother will change. One of my students was in the habit of lying. I told her it was a failure method and that if she lied, she would be lied to. She replied, I don't care. I can't possibly get along without lying. One day she was speaking on the phone to a man with whom she was very much in love. She turned to me and said, I don't trust him, I know he's lying to me. I replied, well, you lie yourself, so someone has to lie to you, and you'll be sure it will be just the person you will want the truth from. Sometime after that I saw her and she said, I'm cured of lying. I questioned, what cured you? She replied, I've been living with a woman who lied worse than I did. One is often cured of her faults by seeing them in others. Life is a mirror, and we find only ourselves reflected in our associates. Living in the past is a failure method and a violation of spiritual law. The robbers of time are the past and the future. Woman should bless the past and forget it, if it keeps her in bondage, and bless the future, knowing that it has in store for her endless joys, but live in the now. For example, a woman came to me complaining that she had no money with which to buy Christmas gifts. She said, last year was so different, I had plenty of money and gave lovely presents, and this year I have scarcely a cent. I replied, you will never demonstrate money while you are pathetic and live in the past. Live fully in the now and get ready to give Christmas presents. Dig your ditches and the money will come. She exclaimed, I know what to do. I will buy some tinsel, twine, Christmas seals and wrapping paper. I replied, do that and the presents will come and stick themselves to the Christmas seals. This too was showing financial fearlessness and faith in God. As the reasoning mind said, keep every cent you have, as you are not sure you will get some more. She bought the seals, paper and twine, and a few days before Christmas received a gift of several hundred dollars. Buying the seals and twine had impressed the subconscious with expectancy, 
and opened the way for the manifestation of the money. She purchased all the presents in plenty of time. Woman must live suspended in the moment. Look well, therefore, to this day. Such is the salutation of the dawn. She must be spiritually alert, ever awaiting her leads, taking advantage of every opportunity. One day, I said continually, silently, Infinite Spirit, don't let me miss a trick. And something very important was told to me that evening. It is most necessary to begin the day with the right words. Make an affirmation immediately upon waking. For example, Today is a day of completion. I give thanks for this perfect day. Miracle shall follow miracle, and wonders shall never cease. Make this a habit, and one will see wonders and miracles come into her life. One morning I picked up a book and read, Look with wonder at that which is before you. It seemed to be my message for the day, so I repeated it again and again, Look with wonder at that which is before you. At about noon a large sum of money was given me, which I had been desiring for a certain purpose. In a following chapter I will give affirmations that I have found most effective. However, one should never use an affirmation unless it is absolutely satisfying and convincing to her own consciousness. And often an affirmation is changed to suit different people. For example, the following has brought success to many. I have a wonderful work in a wonderful way. I give wonderful service for wonderful pay. I gave the first two lines to one of my students, and she added the last two. It made a most powerful statement, as there should always be perfect payment for perfect service, and a rhyme sinks easily into the subconscious. She went about singing it aloud, and soon did receive wonderful work in a wonderful way, and gave wonderful service for wonderful pay. Another student, a businesswoman, took it and changed the word work to business. She repeated, I have wonderful business in a wonderful way, and I give wonderful service for wonderful pay. That afternoon she made a $41,000 deal, though there had been no activity in her affairs for months. Every affirmation must be carefully worded and completely cover the ground. For example, I knew a woman who was in great need and made a demand for work. She received a great deal of work but was never paid anything. She now knows to add wonderful service for wonderful pay. It is woman's divine right to have plenty, more than enough. Her barns should be full and her cup should flow over. This is God's idea for woman and when woman breaks down the barriers of lack in her own consciousness, the golden age will be hers and every righteous desire of her heart fulfilled. The Law of Karma and the Law of Forgiveness Woman receives only that which she gives. The game of life is a game of boomerangs. Woman's thoughts, deeds and words return to her sooner or later with astounding accuracy. This is the law of karma, which is Sanskrit for comeback. Whatsoever a woman soweth, that shall she also reap. For example, a friend told me the story of herself illustrating the law. She said, I make all my karma onto my aunt. Whatever I say to her, someone says to me. I am often irritable at home and one day said to my aunt who was talking to me during dinner, No more talk. I wish to eat in peace. The following day I was lunching with a woman with whom I wished to make a great impression. I was talking animatedly when she said, No more talk. I wish to eat in peace. My friend is in high consciousness so her karma returns to her much more quickly than to one on the mental plane. The more woman knows, the more she is responsible for and a person with a knowledge of spiritual law, which she does not practice, suffers greatly in consequence. The fear of the law is the beginning of wisdom. This is the perfect idea of woman registered in divine mind, awaiting woman's recognition. For woman can only be what she sees herself to be, and can only attain what she sees herself attaining. Nothing ever happens without an onlooker is an ancient saying. Woman sees first her failure or success, her joy or sorrow, before it swings into visibility from the scenes set in her own imagination. So we see freedom from all unhappy conditions comes through knowledge, a knowledge of spiritual law. Obedience precedes authority, 
and the law obeys woman when she obeys the law. The law of electricity must be obeyed before it becomes woman's servant. When handled ignorantly, it becomes woman's deadly foe. So with the laws of mind. For example, a woman with a strong personal will wished she owned a house which belonged to an acquaintance, and she often made mental pictures of herself living in the house. In the course of time, the man died, and she moved into the house. Several years afterward, coming into the knowledge of spiritual law, she said to me, Do you think I had anything to do with that man's death? I replied, Yes, your desire was so strong, everything made way for it, but you paid your karmic debt. Your husband, whom you loved devotedly, died soon after, and the house was a white elephant on your hands for years. The original owner, however, could not have been affected by her thoughts, had he been positive in the truth, nor her husband, but they were both under karmic law. The woman should have said, feeling the great desire for the house, Infinite intelligence, give me the right house, equally as charming as this, the house which is mine by divine right. The divine selection would have given perfect satisfaction and brought good to all. The divine pattern is the only safe pattern to work by. Desire is a tremendous force and must be directed in the right channels or chaos ensues. In demonstrating the most important step is the first step, to ask a right. Woman should always demand only that which is hers by divine right. To go back to the illustration, had the woman taken this attitude, If this house I desire is mine, I cannot lose it. If it is not, give me its equivalent. The man might have decided to move out, harmoniously, had it been the divine selection for her, or another house would have been substituted. Anything forced into manifestation through personal will is always ill-got and has ever bad success. A woman came to me in great distress. Her daughter had determined to take a very hazardous trip and the mother was filled with fear. She had used every argument, had pointed out the dangers to be encountered, and forbidden her to go, but the daughter became more and more rebellious and determined. You are forcing your personal will upon your daughter, which you have no right to do, and your fear of the trip is only attracting it, for woman attracts what she fears. I added, let go, take your mental hands off, put it in God's hands, and use this statement. I put the situations in the hands of infinite love and wisdom. If this trip is the divine plan, I bless it and no longer resist. But if it is not divinely planned, I give thanks now that it is dissolved and dissipated. A day or two after that, her daughter said to her, Mother, I have given up the trip, and the situation returned to its native nothingness. It is learning to stand still, which seems so difficult for woman. I will give another example of sowing and reaping which came in the most curious way. A woman came to me saying she had received a counterfeit $20 bill given to her at the bank. She was much disturbed, for, she said, the people at the bank will never acknowledge their mistake. I replied, let us analyse the situation and find out why you attracted it. She thought for a few moments and exclaimed, I know it, I sent a friend a lot of stage money just for a joke. So now the law had sent her some stage money, for it doesn't know anything about jokes. I said, now we will call on the law of forgiveness and neutralize the situation. So I said, infinite spirit, we call on the law of forgiveness and give thanks that she is under grace and not under law and cannot lose this $20 which is hers by divine right. Now, I said, go back to the bank and tell them fearlessly that it was given to you there by mistake. She obeyed and to her surprise they apologised and gave her another bill, treating her most courteously. So knowledge of the law gives woman power to rub out her mistakes. Woman cannot force the external to be what she is not. If she desires riches, she must be rich first in consciousness. For example, a woman came to me asking treatment for prosperity. She did not take much interest in her household affairs, and her home was in great disorder. I said to her, If you wish to be rich, you must be orderly. All women with great wealth are orderly, and order is heaven's first law. I added, You will never become rich with a burnt match in the pincushion. She had a good sense of humour and commenced immediately, putting her house in order. 
She rearranged furniture, straightened out bureau drawers, cleaned rugs, and soon made a big financial demonstration, a gift from a relative. The woman herself became made over and keeps herself keyed up financially by being ever watchful of the external and expecting prosperity, knowing that God is her supply. Many people are in ignorance of the fact that gifts and things are investments and that hoarding and saving invariably lead to loss. I knew a woman who wanted to buy a luxury overcoat. She and her husband went to various shops, but there was none she wanted. She said they were all too cheap looking. At last she was shown one the salesman said was valued at $1,000, but which the manager would sell her for $500 as it was late in the season. Her financial possessions amounted to about $700. The reasoning mind would have said, you can't afford to spend nearly all you've got on a coat. But she was very intuitive and never reasoned. She turned to her husband and said, if I get this coat, I'll make a ton of money. So her husband consented weakly. About a month later, she received a $10,000 commission. The coat made her feel rich. It linked her with success and prosperity. Without the coat, she would not have received the commission. It was an investment paying large dividends. If woman ignores these leadings to spend or to give, the same amount of money will go in an uninteresting or unhappy way. For example, a woman told me on Thanksgiving Day she informed her family that they could not afford a Thanksgiving dinner. She had the money but decided to save it. A few days later, someone entered her room and took from the bureau drawer the exact amount the dinner would have cost. The law always stands back of the woman who spends fearlessly with wisdom. For example, one of my students was shopping with her little nephew. The child clamoured for a toy which she told him she could not afford to buy. She realised suddenly that she was seeking lack, not recognising God as her supply. So she bought the toy and, on her way home, picked up in the street the exact amount of money she had paid for it. Woman's supply is inexhaustible and unfailing when fully trusted. But faith or trust must precede the demonstration. According to your faith, be it unto you. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For faith holds the vision steady, and the adverse pictures are dissolved and dissipated. And in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Jesus Christ brought the good news that there was a higher law than the law of karma, and that the law transcends the law of karma. It is the law of grace or forgiveness. It is the law which frees woman from the law of cause and effect, the law of consequence, under grace, not under law. We are told on this plane, woman reaps where she has not sown. The gifts of God are simply poured out onto her. All that the kingdom affords is hers. This continued state of bliss awaits the woman who has overcome world thought. The subconscious, being simply power without direction, carries out orders without questioning. Casting the burden, impressing the subconscious. When woman knows her powers and the working of her minds, her great desire is to find an easy and quick way to impress the subconscious with good, or simply an intellectual knowledge of the truth will not bring results. In my own case, I found the easiest way is in casting the burden. A metaphysician once explained it in this manner. She said, The only thing which gives anything weight in nature is the law of gravitation, and if a boulder could be taken high above the planet, there would be no weight in that boulder. We see, therefore, that woman violates law if she carries a burden, and a burden is an adverse thought or condition, and this thought or condition has its root in the subconscious. It seems almost impossible to make any headway directing the subconscious from the conscious or reasoning mind, as the reasoning mind, the intellect, is limited in its conceptions and filled with doubts and fears. How scientific it then is to cast the burden upon the superconscious mind, where it is made light or dissolved into its native nothingness. For example, a woman in urgent need of money made light upon the superconscious with the statement, I cast this burden of lack and I go free to have plenty. The belief in lack was her burden, and as she cast it upon the superconscious with its belief of plenty, an avalanche of supply was the result. Another example. One of my students had been given a new piano, 
and there was no room in her studio for it until she had moved out the old one. She was in a state of perplexity. She wanted to keep the old piano but knew of no place to send it. She became desperate as the new piano was to be sent immediately. In fact, it was on its way, with no place to put it. She said it came to her to repeat, I cast this burden and I go free. A few moments later her phone rang and a woman friend asked if she might rent her old piano and it was moved out a few minutes before the new one arrived. I know a woman whose burden was resentment. She said, I cast this burden of resentment within and I go free to be loving, harmonious and happy. The superconscious flooded the subconscious with love and her whole life was changed. For years resentment had held her in a state of torment and imprisoned her soul, the subconscious mind. The statement should be made over and over and over, sometimes for hours at a time, silently or audibly, with quietness but determination. I have often compared it to winding up a Victrola. We must wind ourselves up with spoken words. I have noticed in casting the burden, after a little while, one seems to see clearly. It is impossible to have clear vision while in the throes of carnal mind. Doubts and fear poison the mind and body and imagination runs riot, attracting disaster and disease. In steadily repeating the affirmation, I cast this burden within and go free, the vision clears and with it a feeling of relief, and sooner or later comes a manifestation of good, be it health, happiness or supply. One of my students once asked me to explain the darkness before the dawn. I referred in a preceding chapter to the fact that often, before the big demonstration, everything seems to go wrong, and deep depression clouds the consciousness. It means that out of the subconscious are rising the doubts and fears of the ages. These old derelicts of the subconscious rise to the surface to be put out. The student continued, How long must one remain in the dark? And I replied, Until one can see in the dark and casting the burden enables one to see in the dark. In order to impress the subconscious, active faith is always essential. Faith without works is dead. In these chapters I have endeavoured to bring out this point. Jesus Christ showed active faith when he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground, before he gave thanks for the loaves and the fishes. Through misunderstanding, a woman had been separated from her husband, whom she loved deeply. He refused all offers of reconciliation and would not communicate with her in any way. Coming into the knowledge of spiritual law, she denied the appearance of separation. She made this statement, There is no separation in divine mind, therefore I cannot be separated from the love and companionship which are mine by divine right. She showed active faith by arranging a place for him at the table every day, thereby impressing the subconscious with a picture of his return. Over a year passed, but she never wavered, and one day he walked in. The subconscious is often impressed through music. Music has a fourth-dimensional quality and releases the soul from imprisonment. It makes a wonderful thing seem possible and easy of accomplishment. I have a friend who uses her Victrola daily for this purpose. It puts her in perfect harmony and releases the imagination. Another woman often dances while making her affirmations. The rhythm and harmony of music and emotion carry her words forth with tremendous power. The student must remember also not to despise the day of small things. Invariably, before a demonstration, come signs of land. Before Columbus reached America, he saw birds and twigs which showed him that land was near. And so it is with a demonstration. But often the student mistakes it for the demonstration itself and is disappointed. For example, a woman had spoken the word for a set of dishes. Not long afterwards, a friend gave her a dish which was old and cracked. She came to me and said, Well, I asked for a set of dishes, and all I got was a cracked plate. I replied, The plate was only signs of land. It shows your dishes are coming. Look upon it as birds and seaweed. And not long afterwards, the dishes came. Continually making believe impresses the subconscious. If one makes believe she is rich and makes believe she is successful, in due time she will reap. For example, I know of a woman who was very poor, but no one could make her feel poor. 
She earned a small amount of money from rich friends who constantly reminded her of her poverty and to be careful and to save. Regardless of their admonitions, she would spend all her earnings on a hat or make someone a gift and be in a rapturous state of mind. Her thoughts were always centred on beautiful clothes and rings and things, but without envying others. She lived in a world of the wondrous, and only riches seemed real to her. Before long she married a rich man, and the rings and things became visible. I do not know whether the man was the divine selection for her, but opulence had to manifest in her life, as she had imaged only opulence. There is no peace or happiness for woman until she has erased all fear from the subconscious. Fear is misdirected energy and must be redirected or transmuted into faith. I am asked so often by my students, how can I get rid of fear? I reply, by walking up to the things you are afraid of. The lion takes its fierceness from your fear. Walk up to the lion and he will disappear. Run away and he runs after you. I have shown in previous chapters how the lion of lack disappeared when the individual spent money fearlessly, showing faith that God was her supply and therefore unfailing. Many of my students have come out of the bondage of poverty and are now bountifully supplied through losing all fear of letting money go out. Woman has so long separated herself from her good and her supply through thoughts of separation and lack that sometimes it takes dynamite to dislodge those false ideas from the subconscious, and the dynamite is a big situation. We see in the foregoing conclusion how the individual was freed from her bondage by showing fearlessness. Woman should watch herself hourly to detect if her motive for action is fear or faith. Choose ye this day whom we shall serve, fear or faith. Perhaps one's fear is of personality. Do not then avoid the people feared. Be willing to meet them cheerfully and they will either prove golden links in the chain of one's good or disappear harmoniously from one's pathway. In the twinkling of an eye, woman's release will come when she realizes there is no power in evil. The material world will fade away and the fourth dimensional world, the world of the wondrous, will swing into manifestation. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away.